Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 289th New Social Environment. I'm Sophia Pedlo, the Managing Director at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Charlotte Kent and Josiah McElhenney. We're also thrilled to have the poet Eileen Tabios here, who will read to close today's program. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in Brooklyn, we are on the unceded land and waters of Lenape Hoking, which belongs to the Wapinga, Kunarsi, Munsi, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. We recognize the legacy of settler colonialism as part of the many contemporary <coughs> expressions of white supremacy. We honor those who have lost their lives to this violence. I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions as we do our part to in the learning and unlearning required to undo this legacy of injustice. And now to introduce today's guest and host. New York-based artist Josiah McElhenney's sculptures, paintings, installations, performances, and films engage with the history of ideas across wide-ranging fields of study, from literature to architecture, music theory, and astronomy, transforming this research into physical form. And Charlotte Kent is an assistant professor of visual culture and an arts writer, as well as an editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. Charlotte, take it away. Thank you everyone at the Rail and thank you for joining us. Um, Josiah, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Well, thank you um, <laughs> it is a pleasure to have you here. And I think we wanna just jump right into the show because um, the library is at James Cohen and the way in which you installed this show is very much a part of the conceit of it and how you designed the space really also sort of speaks to how you were thinking about the Borges story, the Library of Babel that influence, that is a huge influence on it. So I'm wondering if you could just, as we sort of get an initial sense of the space of the exhibit, um, tell us a little bit about how you designed it and the story in your thinking. Um, sure, yeah, so the, the, the title of the show is Libraries, and um, I guess that the, the first thing um, is to say that I'm, I'm sitting in my library, which is the Christine Bergen Library Brooklyn Division. Um, uh, Christine Bergen arranged my library, and, um, and she plays a role in the show in that uh, the, the film that, can, that is the sort of center work of the show is called Portrait of a Library and happens to be her library, uh, the Manhattan Division. Um, so I, I'm a big lover of libraries and libraries have been a kind of core to my work and my life. Um, and uh, I have now um, a medium or medium sized library, I guess, of my own. And it's really the only thing I collect is books uh, and they view them as tools for my work. Um, and then the show is called Libraries because basically and in that sense, it differs from um, Borges because he, his story called the Library of Babel proposes that, uh, that the library, one library and the universe are synonymous. So that basically that the whole space of the universe is a library. And I, well, I love that idea um, or I'm very interested in that idea, I should say. Um, I'm actually most interested in the idea that there are many libraries and that, that basically the implications of his story imply that actually, and that there are endless bodies of knowledge that we have not even begun to look for. And that, so that one kind of library might uh, not, does not limit the, the, the potential for there being many other kinds of libraries. And that might specifically in this case um, imply that uh, that books are not the only way to contain knowledge and that that the written word might not, not might not be the only way to contain knowledge or the only form in which knowledge uh, takes and um, maybe one thing we can talk about more about it later is um, the word knowledge because I realized that for me it has a, one kind of meaning um, but um, that maybe that there's many ways to interpret that word um, so in Borges' story, he describes that the, the, this library that fills every inch of the universe is, con, is constructed out of hexagons. So that's hexagonal rooms that, um, that spread out in every direction as far as you can see, but also as far up and as far down as you can see. 
And um, hexagons were important because uh, they fill all the space. There's no empty space. So, you know, basically would have to be either triangular rooms, square rooms, or hexagonal rooms. And um, hexagonal rooms are uh, allow for um, basically more places to put the books and more doorways to get places. And um, so hexagons are also a kind of mystical shape. So I think that it was the right choice that to understand that how to build this library. Um, and so I wanted to create some sense just with the title of the show and with the architecture itself of traversing um, a kind of hexagonal space as opposed to a kind of space based on 90 degree angles, which is what we're kind of used to in most spaces. And the gallery allowed me to do that, um, which was a, an incredible opportunity. I've never had opportunity to sort of build my own sort of art, mini architectural space. And it, was, it wasn't, you know, not to put uh, too fine a point on it because it, we really only built um, six walls, but we completely changed the space by doing so. And we did have to change some of the ducts in the gallery, but so that most of the angles in the gallery are now 120 degree angles. And, and you basically create a path in the, it creates a kind of path in the inside the gallery, which was simply a rectangle. And you wander through, it draws you through the space to, um, to a, a semi-darkened room where there's also a kind of hexagonal um, space of, of mirrors and, um, and projections and images uh, that are in this portrait of the library that is at, at the, the sort of culmination of the show. Um, and I guess I'd say one more thing, which is just that for me, uh, that the, really the theme is around the, this urgency of the question of how do we know things in this time? And I feel like I grew up with many people who wanted to understand um, truth as something that was not something that was authoritative and something that could be uh, created communally, that could be changed communally, that could be sh um, shared communally, and that could be basically be more expansive than what we have uh, typically understood as truth. And I have now, we are now in a moment where that seems maybe like that was a project that has gotten out of control um, in some strange way that uh, makes me regret some of the things I've said in the past at some, to some extent. And so, but I, but I feel like to me that the, um, you know, one of the central ideas uh, uh, of that, that we have is that knowledge is, is, is maybe an alternative to notions of truth in the sense of knowledge is something you must earn. So you can't be given, you might be able to be given a truth. Somebody can hand you a truth, but knowledge is something you earn so that you, you know, even to read a book to, to get knowledge, you have to work. And, um, and that knowledge can coexist with other knowledges. Totally. And, uh, and I think we're going to talk about that more because I know that um, one of the pieces in particular is sort of a, a way to expand on some of this. And, but I wanted to go back just for a moment to this idea you were saying of, you know, we, many of us, I think, you know, have said things or have thought things that we later then realize maybe aren't what we believe anymore or that even we wish we hadn't believed or thought back then. But it's interesting how one of the challenges with the formation of knowledge that we're currently, in, that has been substantiated is this idea that to have been wrong is, it's, is a problem that we, that isn't a part of the experience of knowledge. And I, and I think about this because I'll always remember there was a moment in time when I was studying Ptolemy and people don't study Ptolemy because he was wrong. He was wrong about the way um, things work. And so, but the point of studying him in that moment was to recognize that the errors that we go through, that the errors and the sort of desire to learn more and to know more are actually very much a part of knowledge. And it's the way in which we sometimes, you know, try and shove them under the rug. And that our disciplinary foundations now are very much about, you know, you have to remain convinced of whatever it was that you thought 
to start with. But I'm gonna just pause us here because we're launching into some of these really big ideas. And um, just before we do, I wanted to say a couple of things, which is one of the things that won't necessarily come across in many of the images that the audience will see that can really only come across when you're there in person is the incredibly reflective, um, uh, the, the types of reflections that are happening in this space. And I'm thinking of it right now just because the piece on the right, uh, the black oval that many people are seeing is um, the piece called uh, Mirror Universe. And it is marquetry, um, uh, oak, is it? I think it's oak, yeah. And, but it has this surface on it and it's so difficult to take a, take a photograph of this piece because if you're standing in front of it, you, it, is, it basically winds up feeling like a selfie <laughs> um, because it is just such a highly reflective surface. And you can see that because of the way some of the other pieces in the show are reflecting in it right now. Um, and there are all these mirrors and there, there are mirrors in the pieces that you see in these sort of vitrines off to the left. So that when you're in the space, you get this experience of so much light being reflected around and, and across to one another. And when we're looking at the individual images in part because of the way they're flattened on the screen, but also in, by nature of having to be able to produce an image at all, some of that, some of that expansiveness of the experience of seeing won't come across. Um, so I just want to take a moment here just to sort of preface some of the images that you'll see with that. But I also, because there's so many intense ideas, I, you collaborate with so many people in your practice and you always have. And it, the, the, besides the Borges story, there's also this poem, um, Mirrors, that Borges wrote that was a really important part of this show. And I'd like us to play a little clip of it um, because I think, It'd be interesting just to hear you respond to it. So is that, can we hear just the first little bit? Mirrors. I've been horrified before all mirrors, not just before the impenetrable glass, the end and the beginning of that space inhabited by nothing but reflections, but faced with specular water mirroring the other blue within its bottomless sky incised at times by the illusory flight of inverted birds or troubled by a ripple, or face to face with the unspeaking surface of ghostly ebony, whose very hardness reflects as if within a dream the whiteness of spectral marble or a spectral rose. Now, after so many troubling years of wandering beneath the wavering moon, I ask myself what accident of fortune handed to me this terror of all mirrors. Um, the poem goes on. It's a beautiful poem and um, either it'll be available in the chat. It's being read by the poet Pamela Sneed. Um, it's also available on the, on the James Cohen Gallery site. Um, but I was struck in this poem that is so much about the horror of mirrors. Do you relate to that in the sense that, I mean, putting aside the history of mirrors and their symbolic functions across time, you've worked with them so much. What resonated for you in this Borges expression of this horror of mirrors? Um, so I was very surprised by the poem um, and this, there's another, a few other poems that he wrote about his fear of mirrors. And um, because I had that same question, like, why is he afraid of mirrors? And, and I don't think that I feel a particular fear of mirrors. Um, I think though that for him, what was, what's at play there is what mirrors mean more than what, than, than what we typically think of um, as, the way mirrors just function in our everyday life. And, um, and I think that one of the things that for me is amazing is that, um, you know, the, the interplay between language and material experience, the experience of materials. And so um, I think that 
we think of a mirror as um, an immaterial object, basically, because we think of it as just the image that's created in our mind. We don't think of it as, as actually having a materiality at all, really. We mostly think of it as an image that's, that's just somehow existing uh, magically uh, in front of us. And so he discusses in, in that poem that, that a mirror can be anything that registers your own presence, um, wh whether that be metal, uh, water, wood, and um, and I was so struck by the notion of wood being a mirror that that uh, led me on a 20 year uh, exploration of, of the idea of making mirrors out of wood. Um, but it all comes down to, I think that for, for him, mirrors are a, a symbol simply of the question of, of where does the self start and stop? And basically, and basically how do you define the self? And basically that, I think that that's at some level, um, uh, the the core of Borges' work, which which I think you could sum up as being Borges and I, which is a kind of theme in some uh, that he names that way. So like there, there's a there's a person called I and there's a person called Borges and they're 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 both the same and not the same, and um and this is a kind of theme the replication of the self, um, the infinity of the self, and how frightening that is and. That basic, and I there I really get get him, and in the sense that basically, um, you want to to understand yourself, you want to reflect on yourself, you want to be to understand your place in the world, and you, yet you also want to exist in the world. You want to just go out in the world and feel uh, the sense, the sensory experience of being in the world, this this the emotions that you feel, um, and there is a kind of strange conflict between being truly uh, self-reflexive and being just an experiencing being in the world. And the idea that basically there, there are multiple selves of yourself to deal with so that you, you need to not only reflect on, on a thing, on, on this, this, this personal, very deeply interior personhood that you have, and, but you must also reflect on how other people see you. So each, each other person has their own image of you. And it, the more you think about that, the more overwhelming it gets. And the idea that, that you aren't one single being. And so for him, it, uh, it all goes back to a, a book that I, that I um, commissioned the first translation of, which was written in prison in 1871. And basically it essentially is the, the first uh, idea that uh, if the universe is infinite, um, that there are doppelgangers, that there are doubles. But the, the really scary part is that, is that if there are doubles, there are basically infinite doubles. So there's not just, you can't have an infinite universe that has a single double of yourself you basically have an endless set of doubles of yourself. And that's a very frightening idea. So um, th that's where it began for me was, was in the idea of, it began for me in the idea of um, that to be a modern person, one must be self-reflexive um, to, you know, even the idea of going through psychotherapy is, is basically about this idea that you should be able to sort of stand outside yourself and see something of who you are in order to be a kind of uh, more full human being, which in some ways is fantastic and in some ways is a, an incredible burden. Um, so that, that's where it began for me. Hmm. It's, I think that's one of the challenges, I mean, this notion of the postmodern subject, right? Having this kind of multiplicity is something, I mean, the, how, people have been sort of thinking through and around for over a century now in various different forms. Um, Borges winds up interestingly being this recurring reference for so many people who have been thinking about that, which is one of the reasons I think he's become such a founding figure for so many. It was actually in seeing this body of work, um, I was reminded of the fact that Foucault writes about the fact that he wrote The Order of Things partly inspired by a Borges story. Um, and The Order of Things is of course his great book on the archeology span of knowledge. And it's, the, it's Borges, the analytical language of John Wilkins that he's responding to. And he quotes this particular passage where um, 
Bohr has described Wilkins classification system in the division of animals as including like animals that are owned by the emperor and tame dogs and sirens. And it's just, it's this sort of ridiculously nonsensical classification system. And Foucault was so impressed by this ability to think in this completely other way that it shattered for him the rigidity of thought structures um, and allowed him to start developing his own thinking through of like how to think about the values that are in that are inherent to certain types of thought structures. Um, I was struck by that because of course, if there's a similar sort of feeling going on here, right? There's a kind of um, that your library is like this one, the Library of Interplanetary Harmonies, um, seems in fact to suggest very much that you've been thinking about knowledge, right? And you've already started telling us a little bit about how you've been thinking about it. And this idea that we have to break down thought structures in order to start trying to understand other ways of understanding knowledge. So I'm wondering if you could just say like how Borges in that sense contributed to that thinking, um, how you're rethinking certain values in producing this project. Um, and maybe a little bit, maybe by thinking about with this one, like how the li each of these different libraries represent that. Um, yeah, uh, I first I just wanna give a shout out to Pamela Sneed who really kindly um, recorded uh, a new reading of the poem, and and I, if you have time, it's only three minutes long. I encourage you to listen to it. She's one of the greatest poets of our our um, our age, I think, but she's also one of the great great poet readers of our time too. And so I have gotten to be um, uh, good friends with her during this COVID time, um, and so she kindly agreed to read it. Uh, for for us, so I just wanted to say a big thank you to her, um, and encourage you to also to read her new book called Funeral Diva, which just came out in City Lights Books, which is an incredible um, anthology of poetry. Um, um, I guess so. As we, you've been speaking, I've been learning um, a lot already, just as the, as the things that you've said and both things that both confirm things that I believe in, add things, new things to think, things that I didn't know. Um, and I guess that one things I didn't realize until you've been talking about this, that in some sense, the, my show is, it's not that it's anti-Borges, but it's basically, it's proposing something somewhat different than what Borges was proposing in the story. Um, many people I see this um, responding to the story see it in, as a kind of nihilistic story where basically like knowledge breaks down. There are books in the library that just have one word or no words, um, you know, because basically every book in the library is supposed to have, uh, the books in the library are supposed to have every possible book that can be written in every possible language um, and in every possible combination. Um, and that this leads to a kind of like where knowledge almost kind of dissipates. Um, it to some extent, and that the librarians are left in a kind of hard place because they're trying to find what are the connections between all of this massive amount of information. Um, I interpret it differently. I interpret it as hopeful in the sense of that there, it's just that it means that there's so much to be found in, in the library. Um, but I also think that it points towards the limits of this idea uh, of the beloved book, which is so important to me, and the written word, and um, uh, you know, and you know, the written written um, knowledge. I've always believed in the the notion of, of 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 things that can only be learned in person. Things can only be learned in um, from from another person. Um, things that are cannot be described in words. Uh, things that have to be experienced in other ways. And so, um, so in that sense, I wanted to imply that there could there, that if just as there may be multiverses, there may be more than one universe, then there may be more than one library universe, and there may be an endless number of them, and they may all be created out of different kinds of knowledge. And that actually looking actually for not only um, for, let's say, 
a kind of database of knowledge that we just haven't looked at, like a file in a, in a cabinet that we have not explored. It's also to look at how we're looking for knowledge and in what, what places and in what ways we look for knowledge. So this piece um, was actually the first uh, idea I had. And it's and like all of the all of the pieces, it's it's formed out of um, just a couple of basic uh, precepts. One is that it's framed. So it's a frame that sits flat against the wall uh, that's supposed to look like a, a painting. And basically it's sort of um, uh, maybe it's could be viewed as a, a kind of rather thick bordered. Uh, frame or it could be like a thin bordered frame with a mat, but basically it's an image that sits on the wall and this image though, even though it's still, it changes radically as you move around it. Um, and that's very important to me because I think that that's one of the, the most uh, uh, central things that art can offer today is that it's a place in which the human body and the human mind in combination can create new thoughts. Um, whereas basically the, um, you know, this late stage capitalism wants to propose that basically all, all information can be, um, can be transmitted without the use of the human body essentially. Um, and solely through, through the format of, of things that can be translated into um, ones, ones and zeros. Um, and so in each case though, the title of the, of the library is the main clue. The title of the, the artwork, the title of the quote unquote painting uh, is, the, is, is the, the first main clue. So to try to generate some kind of um, magic, if you will, some kind of sense of exploration that opens out. And um, so this is called From, from the Library Everything's told from the library of something, and so to, to 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 kind of suggest that there's again that there's many libraries. This is from the Library of Interplanetary Harmonies, and that's a nod to an ode to Sun Ra. Um, so that's it, interplanetary harmonies is a is a a line, a kind of a chorus line from a, a, one of his great um, songs uh, compositions. And it also is a kind of homage to some of his ideas of sy synthesis of contemporary and um, ancient knowledge. So it's supposed to look like a kind of melodic uh, assemblage of strange, crazy objects that are repeated and endlessly unfolding into a hexagonal set of reflections. Um, and these, uh, these spheres that are suspended uh, in space are proportionally based on the key of F sharp minor right in the middle of the piano keyboard. And basically, so they're based on both proportional relationship, but also the actual physical size. So, um, so for example, F sharp at around middle A is about six inches long, that sound wave. And then B, B flat is like, um, is about three inches long um, uh, uh, at that same place on the keyboard, and so the the spheres are are basically sized following following that, and so it's supposed to suggest not in any one to one kind of way, but that this could be this container or this representation or this allegory for the knowledge of the of sound gravitational waves, the interrelationship of the movement of cosmic bodies in um, in the universe. It could be uh, the floating um, cosmic bodies themselves. It, they could be um, representing what is maybe the most one of the most common and ancient ideas across human cultures uh, in, in general, which is to see uh, the connection between music and um, and the cosmic realm which I think is a natural thing considering the fact, and natural, I don't mean like natural law, but just simply unsurprising in that if potentially language was preceded by us singing potentially, um, that music may come before language. And that also look, then that looking at the way the, the, uh, the sky uh, orders our world, it seems like a, an obvious thing to, to me that, that people would throughout uh, human history uh, 
connect those things and they still connect them today. So the reason why it's in F sharp minor is because through some of my research um, or not research, I would, wouldn't go so far as to say is that through my collaboration with um, the scientific community, one of the things that came out of it was that um, a composer I was working with um, and a scientist's work, um, the composer realized that the scientist had uh, figured out that or translated that the gravitational waves that um, that uh, um, represent how the universe has expanded over the past 13 and a half billion years are in the key of F sharp minor, which is a very melancholy key. Uh, very, very few things are composed in it. Um, so in Sun Ra we was trying to do, uh, kind of create in this synthesis between was he saw as you know the space age and basically very very ancient knowledge around um, uh, ideas of of cosmic harmonies, and he found that you know that those things should be connected as a way to create a message for how to restructure society, and so all of that is <laughs> the sort of inspiration for these like crazy uh, set of. Um, mysterious forms and uh i think i mean i just want to touch up just for a moment just because yeah. there's a lot of information you're sharing with us at once i mean it's helpful just to recognize that like there are these different pieces of your research and your thinking that are being layered to create each of these um libraries and the way that they are then visualized for us and i think that that's one of the you know sort of core ideas that Borges illuminated for Foucault, but that I think one can get out of this is that, that the way in which we go about our thinking, right, whether it's a type of logical structure or whether it's a, a formation, influences what we are capable of thinking, right? And this is this kind of, that particular library enables a particular way of thinking about this particular thought, you know, this particular idea. So, I mean, you mentioned Sun Ra, and of course, you know, many were familiar with some of the work you've done, both with Sun Ra and with, um, you know, many of the science, you know, many scientists, you've mentioned just a little bit of that. Um, in this one from the Library of Cosmic Rays, I mean, this happens to be one of my favorites. I just really love this piece in that way that you just kind of can't help sometimes, but be drawn to ones. Um, you've said about how the past is not past. And I think that that's a really important idea for us to carry with us right now, that the past is not past. And yet at the same time, how do we move, how do we move forward, right? And I, was, and I wanted to sort of use the recent work you've done that has been so many collaborations with musicians and with performers and with um, scientists to talk, to ask a little bit about how that work, how the thinking that happened in that work was able to contribute to the thinking and the making that became this show. Um, I, I mean, that's a, uh, a wonderfully challenging question for me to answer. I guess that, I guess that I would say that um, I, I'm an artist who's, who's tried to, as maybe was in, stated in, in my, the introduction, you know, to take research and transform it. And, um, and basically meaning I'm interested in learning things and then um, using um, some kind of, not, not a rule-based process, but some kind of um, exploratory process of finding some way of translating things I've learned into something else, basically. And that else isn't necessarily traceable back to the original research. And, and in that sense, um, I am maybe unconfounding in that way, in the sense of that it's based on, 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 on uh, real things, but the result isn't necessarily an illustration of those real things. Um, and so uh, I guess in the past, I've tried to um, oftentimes tried to create something that was had some uh, explicit uh, uh, 
demonstration of, of the values I was trying to get across in terms of like what, what I was, what it was that I'm hoping for in terms of re, re-understanding things. So for example, like I made a whole series of works which talk about the history of the war between the people who wanted the world to be um, black and white and the world people who wanted it to be colored, meaning these male architects in the early 20th century who argued over socialist, socialist ideas versus what you could call capitalist ideas. And the capitalists obviously won. And that what is, is why we live in a mostly black and white world and where we could have lived in a colorful world and that had a lot of other better qualities than the world we live in. Um, and I guess now I wanted to, um, one of the things about working with other people is that I wanted to allow myself to, to, um, to invent more. So basically the, the, the impressive level of faith that it takes to truly invent. I've never wanted to make new things, but I want, in this show, I wanted to allow something more of in of a kind of uh, invention to in, in, infect me. Um, and the film, the film project, A Portrait of a Library, is all about people who who took irrational ideas basically and generated whole bodies of knowledge around that. Um, and so, like in this case, like what's depicted here are like my sort of imaginary idea of a cosmic ray collector, a kind of, that has an elliptical lens at the top that's gathering cosmic rays and then it's then collecting them in this orb at the center and then maybe radiating them back out at you. And I, it's just a, it's a crazy idea. And yet there's something about this actual structure that's not so far from a real cosmic ray detector, which <laughs> is a real thing. Um, and it's something about this, the, the encountering, for example, the Sun Ra Orchestra, which still continues today. The idea that um, this belief that, that, um, that ideas that are impossible to reconcile in, in any kind of perfectly equation-like um, way that we understand normally, um, you know, some, you know, X equals X, um, might actually be the best way for us to understand how to restructure society. And I'm just kind of astounded by that idea that, so this idea that, that, that Sun Ra came here to save black people and thereby the, all of us um, or, or, or the rest of society as well. And that this information came from the cosmos and that it, this is real. And he, he always said that he was doing mathematics. And um, so I guess I'm just trying to um, take all of this uh, history of trying to translate research and trying to let something else infect me that, that um, uh, a, a, kind of, a kind of insanity maybe. I'm glad, I mean, it's, it's nice to hear that sort of challenge about um, inventing, right? Because it, it is so difficult and there is, and from my perspective, there's something, there's some, in seriousness, there's something that can challenge being inventive, that can challenge being creative. And I think that there's a way, and maybe we can go to the next slide here to look at, um, from the Library of Elements, there's this way in which we're sometimes challenged to get beyond the ways in which we've been given and that one of the ways we do that sometimes is through humor. And I found in this one in particular um, from the Library of Elements as, as a type of humor that I, and I wanted to just bring that out for a second because I think it speaks to this, like how can we get out of the path we've been on? There's something about humor that trips us up, right? It's incongruous, it's unexpected. It, it deviates us from the path that we're on in potentially a really productive way. And to me, there's something very dear, but also humorous about this human drive to get to elements, right? We not only want to 
like have sort of these elemental things that we can be like that that's the origin that's the thing from which the other things are made right but then we also like to have them sort of like russian dolls nest inside each other right so kepler wanted to have you know the the five known planets align with the um platonic forms and you know we do like the music has to match with the number of colors that there are going to be and we go to these sort of like in retrospect, very dear and amusing efforts to make things be the elemental thing we're looking for. Um, and then of course, at the same time, you mentioned that this particular piece was partly um, inspired by uh, Duchamp's um, molds. And that's another sort of example of someone who's like, all right, like we will take nine bachelors and what will they be? They will be a policeman and a cavalry officer and a busboy and, you know, sort of a priest and sort of does this yet again, like we will categorize the bachelors and we will identify them and this is what they are. This is the elemental natures. And there's something funny in that and Borges is funny like I don't read him as being this sort of nihilistic thing I think there's enormous humor in Borges not least with the Library of Babel that in the the book we are reading must de facto be one of the library books but it's talking about itself right like there's this sort of and I think I'm interested in humor in this way because of the way it can help us shift into new spaces and so I was just wondering if humor, how humor operates for you and in your work and your thinking and your practice. Um, Cause I think it's so easy to think everything is always serious. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really um, touched by your bringing that up. I, I hadn't been thinking about humor directly in this show until you bring it up, but it's very much, I see it in this piece and I'm, I'm glad you see it that way, um, it's it actually has had a lot to do with my work um, uh, uh, around this guy named Paul Shearbart. And basically what happened with me around him was that I was kind of um, so depressed by the history of modernism in the sense of the, 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 um, the history of modernism. It's just kind of depressing. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just leave it at that. And I was just like, is, is there any alternative? And basically, you know, or was there any alternative as well? And I discovered Paul Shearbart and basically it was my favorite quote about him is um, he said, I became a humorist out of rage, not out of kindness, which is a kind of koan like statement that you can unfold and unfold and unfold. And 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 then and then um, my other favorite um, thing to bring up about him is that in, in contemporaneously a, a poet named Georg Hecht, um, who died flying uh, biplanes in or triplanes in World War One, um, he said um, when Sherbart experts gather together, something arises among them, a grand collective silence, <laughs> and um, so that gives you and sort of a picture of who of, of his of his attitude and other people's attitude about him. But basically he, um, he basically was, I think one of the most influential people um, on Western thought in, in, uh, that you've never heard of. Um, you know, Walter Benjamin say, said he was his favorite writer, um, which irritates the heck out of any Benjamin scholar I've ever met. Um, and, um, and a lot of people dislike him as a writer, but um, he, but one of the things that I just, that was interesting about him was that he offered, he did offer another alternative way of thinking about modernism, which was basically, which was simply that of humor. And that he basically, he thought that all utopias would fail, but we should talk about them anyway. And that, and that, that through humor was some kind of salvation. And that through humor was a way of both seeing our flaws and in a way living with them. And, um, and so, Yes, so I've been uh, trying to understand. I'm I'm not very good at humor myself. I sometimes feel like I need to take a class in it, but um, but I think um, you're right that that essentially without some level of humor, um, we're lost, and and that that uh, we have to insert it in as whenever we can in some level, and um, and that's uh, and that. And that that optimism lies there somehow. 
Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that I go to optimism because I sort of, <laughs> I, I tend to, I find it difficult, but I do, I do believe in humor in that way that you were describing of like, we have to, we have to be there with it or we can't keep going. Um, it's. Well, maybe you're right. I mean, Shirbat did um, kill himself in protest over World War One. So, um, you know, so yes, I don't know. Yeah, it's. I mean, I also just, you know, comedy is also one of those sort of forgotten thing. You know, we forget about comedy so often. And, you know, not only because we have Aristotle's book on tragedy, but not on comedy, right? So many, though most, so almost most philosophers will study at some point humor, right? It's always a sort of sidelined part of their thinking. It's always, you know, I find distressing how often we become obsessed with the serious in art as if that was the only value. And I think that there's politics involved in being attached to the hierarchy that tragedy is supposed to be to comedy. Um, and that those are, those are politics, like to your point about like how do, you know, different libraries open us up to different types of thinking when we can, when we have an opportunity to question these things, we can maybe discover new ways of thinking about them. Um, but we should we should go on to seed from the library of seeds because from the library of seeds, I mean, there's a way in which it is, you know, seeds work both figuratively and literally, right? Um, so, that, you know, as most of us know, there's this global seed vault in Norway um, that is specifically about a library of seeds to protect against the increasing loss of biodiversity. Um, the seed banks of Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq, for example, were destroyed. And so they are really just what mitigates that kind of eradication. Um, but seeds are also the start of something new, right? And there's a, I'm gonna read just a brief another passage from Borges, if you'll forgive me, um, from The Wall and Books. And he writes, music, states of happiness, mythology, faces belabored by time, certain twilights and certain places try to tell us something or have said something we should not have missed, or are about to say something. This imminence of a revelation which does not occur is perhaps the aesthetic phenomenon. And I, I love this passage because to me, it, it makes me sort of think about the possibility of art as a seed. Um, and I was wondering whether you see that or how, you know, how else you were thinking about seeds and art? I mean, I, the, I, I'm, I feel moved by your reading and your thinking on this. I, my first thought is, is, is going back to um, your notion of being wrong and errors. And, um, and I, I think I like to be wrong. Um, I'm, I, I often think I'm right and, and I'm often wrong. Um, and I enjoy that and I think it's funny. Um, and, um, and, um, and, I, and when you say art as a seed, I'm, I'm very um, fascinated by that notion. I think that I'm all, I think that every generation, every artist, every person can reinvent what art is and should at some level, if they feel moved to do so, try, because art is a, can constantly, its purposes, its methods, its possibilities are endless and, and, and can be all, ever renewed. Um, and so how, when you say art is a seed, it's, it's a very interesting question because how does, how does art prompt something? How does art start something? And um, so I'm, I'm taken back to, um, I, I like to uh, feel humiliation sometimes because sometimes humiliation can be a great teacher. Mm -hmm. So I was at Thomas Hershorn's um, monument to Gram the Gramsci Monument in, in the Bronx. And I spent the whole day there and there was a man who was living in that, that housing project um, there where it was located in the, in the um, courtyard. And um, he was on, live on the radio the whole day and I was kind of avoiding him because he was kind of dragging people in to um, be interviewed live on the radio and I was shy I didn't want to be on the radio 
And um, finally, he was like, you know, you come over here. And um, uh, he said, I said, he said, um, he, he said, what is art for? And I said, uh, well, art is there to give uh, people to create permission for people to think. And he said, I don't need anybody's permission to think. And basically, I was so humiliated and completely undone. And because basically I had been thinking that art was a seed to help people think in a way that to help people to, to um, basically be like a prompt, like basically be like exactly like you said, like a seed, like here's the thing that would open you out. And I'm feeling that like remembrance of the humiliation in my stomach. And it was, that's why humiliation could be so interesting because you, you learn so much because I was so shocked by his response that it was so right on. Like, because of course, no one needs permission to think. And basically everybody thinks and everybody has insight. And, um, and it doesn't take art to have insight. You don't, and it, uh, art, so what is art for? And so uh, it's, it's an interesting um, question. I'm, maybe I've gone on a tangent here, but I think that what, I'm, what, I'm, what it's taught me since then is, is to never underestimate the complexity of, um, of what a seed is, what a beginning is. And basically it, it lies in some um, sense of openness. And basically, so that's why um, I'm interested in this idea that uh, these pieces, uh, if, they, if they succeed or fail on their ability to create people uh, moving around. So mm -hmm. basically, I wouldn't say that they're the seed of thought, but they're the seed of motion. And so basically, if they create a sense for some reason that you want to move around and you move around and maybe you will think uh, something that you wouldn't have thought when you're standing still. And I think that that's, uh, I've come to set my goals very, very like, let, let's say very, um, um, is simple in that sense. Like if you can get somebody to move around and look, that's like, feels like an incredible achievement. So it's like, basically, if you, I often think that if you look at somebody's body language, um, if they're standing still and then wander on, stand still, wander on, but if they move around, that's a different kind of achievement. Um, so that's, um, yeah. I feel like that leads us perfectly into one of the last um, sort of paintings that we get to talk about, which is from the Library of Elliptical Motion. Um, and I, I mean, we, we have to keep talking about this idea of how motion influences thought. And um, I had shared earlier with some people the way in which I wandered around the gallery bouncing around, right? So I was looking at reflections and I was, and I was convinced that if I you know, moved over here, I could see this other reflection and sort of the way in which different ideas came across to me as I was moving from one to the next, right? But I was also, I wanna, because this is called from the Library of Elliptical Motion, I feel like we have to you know, give credit to Kepler and really what an extraordinary thought it was that he had that the planets would move in, in, a, in an ellipse. And, and it's really an incredible thought because that shift to suggest that the planets move and they're moving around two foci, right? One is the sun and one is empty. And it's a, in that moment when he's doing this research, right? The notion of emptiness was still an incredibly dangerous idea to present. Um, it was, people had fought Descartes on the notion of zero because how could there be a zero? It was against God to have zero, right? So there's still this, this recent history for him around that. And in addition, I happen to know his mom was, tied, was tried for witchcraft and his aunt was burned at the stake. And so he's also very aware of the way in which certain types of activities associated with thinking practices are dangerous and that as important as they are, that these two women were doing this act and 
um, herbalism is very much one where the movement of the body, like the way you forage, what time of day, what time of month, what time of year, whether you press or you chop or you distill, these physical actions, these motions influence what is thought to be able to then be produced from the herb. So it's, you know, in this way, this is, I feel like this is very much an extraordinary thing for Kipla to have risked the kind of motion that allowed this thought that, you know, changes everything. Um, and it speaks to the way you were talking earlier about how important it is to move, right? To move and think, how, how do you generate that? How do you generate that for yourself? And then of course, for these pieces. Um, well, when I began to think about this piece, I wanted to, I was thinking about like, how, how would you, could you have a library of movement and could, especially about um, dance? Cause I, I, you know, I'm very interested in, I'm interested in too many things. I'm interested in dance and, um, and uh, have been, had the opportunity to collaborate with some um, people in the dance field and, um, and been, you know, talking about the difference between, you know, the medical idea of proprioception and the dance idea of proprioception, um, which are related, but different. Um, and then I started to think about the ellipse because, um, uh, well, the ellipse plays a role in the other part of the show, which is the two wooden mirrors are um, ellipses. And I was thinking about elliptical motion itself um, and Kepler in particular, um, because as you were saying, it's this, that, that basically the ellipse is this kind of magic form because it doesn't, it's, you know, the only, um, common geometric form with two centers, not one center. And, and it's also the uncentering of us in the world. So like, basically it's like, he's really the person who's like really saying we are absolutely not at the center of anything. And, um, um, and, you know, and, and in, 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 uh, returning to what you're saying about errors and being wrong, what I find really fascinating about Kepler is that is in that sense, and and where I talk about humor is that that basically he he was um, convinced that it was not that way. I mean, he he did not want it to be this way. He was actually absolutely mystically convinced that uh, the the orbits should be round, and mm -hmm. um, and in this particular relationship to each other based on the Platonic solids. But it's only through his dogged, incredibly dogged. Um, the, probably one of the most amazing single-handed efforts of, of careful observation um, that proved himself wrong. And basically it was his commitment to, to that uh, level of, of proof to himself uh, to be wrong um, that gave us this decentering. And I, uh, I love that idea that it's through observation um, that not that you learn to be right, but that you that you learn where you're wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that, um, so I thought, that, and I, it's a challenge to make something that's uh, elliptical. And of course, these aren't perfect ellipses. Um, but I was thinking that ellipses also had a sense of the way that the shape is formed. Um, it it kind of feels like something is moving in there, like like uh, a, a circle has a staticness and an ellipse has something of the perfection of a circle, but maybe implies more of emotion. So I was imagining as if there's, um, uh, you know, atoms like in a collider or a, a, a particle collider moving in there. And then as well, that it generates things that are seem um, um, uh, anthropomorphic. So these, these forms look like maybe some de Chirico painting or something like that. And I was uh, thinking that that is also important because the ellipse is the ultimate in decentering the self in the sense of like, no, I am not the center. It's like we, me and another, me and the other, Boris and I, you and I, um, we make two centers and that's the world. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting that you described it as emptiness, but another way of describing it might be you and I. Um, and um, I think of it as like an, un we don't know, we the, that other center is unknown, right? And it's interesting because that it can yeah, be, I mean, for, 
for Lacan, right, this is one of the whole things around Lacan's trying to get out, you know, to, to negotiate some of what he's thinking through in response to Freud. It's like to try and get us to get out of the imaginary and to be able to recognize that the self is created through this sort of transversal relationship with the other, that that's where being sort of really is. But what's interesting about it is like that, that other focus remains unknown, right? And I think that that's a really, there's, there's something about the unknowingness of it that I think remains valuable in part because it keeps us open, right? It keeps us from presuming, from categorizing too quickly, too easily. Um, which I think really well gets us to the film, which is the portrait of a library. Um, and you, you've mentioned it a little bit, um, and we're gonna get to watch a, a couple clips, but I'm wondering if you would just explain uh, for the audience the layout of this room and like why that was important to the way, the content of the film as well. Um, yes, uh, so that it's a semi, or a partial piece of the hexagon. And there are two uh, pairings and one is a projection and one is a uh, like a, a monitor, but the monitor uh, turns into a mirror periodically. And um, when the monitor turns into peri a, a mirror, the projection uh, goes to a white kind of, or mostly white kind of uh, color to illuminate you so that you see yourself in the mirror. And, um, and the, it's kind of as a fugue structure in its editing so that basically nothing is ever the same, even though the material is repeated, nothing is ever the same from one side of the room to the other. And so that basically, even when you see um, reflected in one set of frames, the other, p other set of frames, they're never the same. So that you have this sense of this uh, constant ongoing change and the sound from above is either um, um, either the voice of Christine speaking about one of 12 figures in her library or it's this very very special sound of rain um, as we're looking at the titles in the books um, and it's the, the images are very complex layered um, images using uh, the kinds of structures that are possible in um, chemical processing of film, but it's it's we've transferred the film to a digital format, but it's it's the kinds of things that you can do with optical printing um, and um, positive, negative, and uh, um, also um, over double double printing of images offset so they're not matching um, and is a very complex actually thing to discuss because there's so many techniques involved, but it's quite hallucinatory, um, sort of a strange um, uh, set of images uh, that feel very, very layered, but you're constantly brought in and out of looking at yourself. So it, you have this sort of falling in and out of this uh, intimate relationship to Christine talking very kind of, um, um, also intimately with with a couple of people in her library and then looking at yourself and it has a funny um, unusual relationship to the moving image in that way. I think it will help. I think we can watch. Um, there's going to be two short clips that we're going to play. Um, one immediately followed by the other. It's very kind of typical in a way of uh, a schizophrenic behavior is this insistence, you know, what is wrong with you? Why can't you see that? So here's Shaver, and I like at the end of this book, he has this nice little thing. Above are two pieces of Picasso sculpture beside a slice of pre-deluge rock. Which is less enigmatic, which is better art? Which has the most to say about mankind, what he is and what he could be? There are stories of Lemuria and the evil Darrows. He thought there were evil Darrows underground.
it's very kind of typical in a way of uh, a schizophrenic behavior. And then the next, no, the next one is uh, a different section, but I think that having the two of them together will just sort of help the audience get a sense of the overall. You can see there's just a little bit of blue in it. Yeah, it's hard to, it's not very blue anymore. So that's 18 seconds. Oh, do you want me to hold? I see a little bit that it was bluing, but definitely blue paper. And again, the, the more kind of out there an idea is, the more of an effort there is made to get substantiating letters from fellow scientists. So that, I mean, one of the things about uh, the experience of being in the room and watching it is uh, it's not a single screen. You are having these visual experiences happening around you. You are having yourself reflected back. Um, and maybe that makes you turn and go to look at one of the other screens. So there's a sort of motion of because of what's happening on the screens that makes you move. Also that there's ways in which it, one can be in there and then you float out and you go and you look at one of the pieces in the gallery and then you kind of float back in to see what is going on so it's very much a kind of fluid experience in and out um, which seemed really appropriate for it I know it's called the uh, portrait of a library but for me it was also like from the library of irration or something um, because it's speaking to these other ways of thinking um, what is this library um, uh, well, first, I just want to give a shout out to Jeff Price. Um, uh, this piece is like very much a deep, deep collaboration between the two of us. And, and so, and it's so much of it is his, uh, thinking about, about cinema and, and some level, the piece is actually about, um, a, a collaboration between us about how one becomes immersed, um, and how how does immersion happen and how does cinema how does the moving image create create immersion um and so i think that the this question of motion and going in and out is this is part of this um the exploration of the piece um and it has a lot of history in, in its in terms of its way it's constructed in terms of uh how um how pe other people have thought about um editing structures uh, in the sort of expanded cinema world. And so that's just kind of a reference and also just big shout out to, to Jeff. I'm so lucky to work with him um, on this piece. We worked on for five years and have completed it for this show. Um, the library is, uh, is uh, my friend's library, Christine Bergen. And basically uh, it's a library that she, it's her personal library that she has uh, built over decades and it's a library that is it's not a systematic thing but it's it's following her interest and it's basically her interest in in people who who create bodies of knowledge um single-handedly basically and so in the, one of the in one of the clips there you you heard her talking about a guy named Richard Shaver who wrote many many books about, and when I say many, I, I like, I don't know if it's like 10 or 12 or, you know, it's like a lot of books um, about um, this, his search for uh, uh, the history of the Atlantean people in rocks. So basically cutting open rocks and within the rocks, you, you know, just, you know, stone and within the stone, you would find the history of the Atlantean people. And essentially, I mean, it was very deadly serious. Um, I liked that you used the word before amusing, um, you know, that the, our amusing search for the elemental nature of things. Um, and uh, certainly I think that it would be, it's easy to see him as being somewhat amusing in that way. Um, but it's uh, her dedication to this library and these, these, these objects, these books uh, is because at some level, um, I think Christine truly believes in um, the importance of thinking this way 
and basically and is very interested in what we might learn by withholding judgment and trying to follow the sense of what might be found by ordering the world in this unordered way, essentially, like where, where there's this endless set of potential, even beginning, beginning actually from something that one might assume is wrong or absolutely know is wrong, but still building a kind of body of knowledge around it and an exploration of the world around it. And that there's something, maybe something very strange that will happen to us um, that could be useful or helpful by thinking this way. And I have actually come to believe strongly in this possibility because certainly uh, quote unquote rational thought has um, not gotten humanity to a perfect spot by any stretch of the imagination. So um, that's a sort of interesting, I mean, I, I, it's funny to come back to Foucault, but in one of his, I mean, he obviously he's written about madness and sort of the way in which we can actually think of it as a structure of knowing um, a lot, but uh, in one of his later books, Language, Counter Memory and Practice, he writes this thing where he says, it may be time for us to renounce the will to knowledge and prepare to revere a certain practice of stupidity. Um, and it's a sort of blunt statement on his part, right? And I, I don't think he's trying to put down or demean, right? Like this practice to revere this practice of stupidity, I think is very much about like being open, you know, like the way you describe um, Christine Bergen, like having this library of people, like, maybe there's something to be found here if we can remain open to trying to think through what the stakes are in this type of knowledge and what the stakes are in refusing it, right? Because it might not be that we want that particular body of knowledge, but we might be able to uncover the stakes in our structure of knowledge that refuse us from encountering that one, right? Um, just in the interest of time, I want to make sure we do get to touch a little bit on the map. Um, and so um, it's one of the, you know, it's a very different type of piece in the context of like all these mirrors and screens and reflections. And this is the map of the library map of universe. It's an intaglio print with Pershoir. Um, but maps are themselves a type of reflection. Um, and so I was wondering if you would just tell us a little bit about how you decided to make this piece. Um, and yeah, like how, how did this piece come to fit into the show? Well, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to find um, different ways that people could think through the, the, the ideas. Um, and one of, one of the things I wanted to have is something that looked looked like art. Like, so a lot of the other stuff in the show doesn't necessarily look like art. Um, and um, so I wanted there to be one thing that looked like art. Um, and so that was, and so that was important to me because I wanted it to be, because the show is all about framing and basically the idea that framing, through framing, you can see through and beyond into another world and that the framing could help you see um, that, that there, there should be something that that basically grounds it also in in the history of what people like think of as art for the capital A. So that was the first thing, and so it's pretty obvious to me that that I what I should do is 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 um, take on the controversy of the map of of Borges Library. So there's been 75 years of controversy uh, over how to map the library. Uh, Borges himself made a mistake. Um, in um, in his uh, original story, I just met somebody on Saturday who says they have a copy of the handwritten manuscript, um, uh, which I'd love to see. Although I don't read the, um, I can't read in, in the original. But um, he then corrects one of the mistakes, or, or corrects a mistake in subsequent publication and then leaves two further conundrums that make it very difficult to understand exactly how this library is constructed. Um, and so there's many different maps and people are today like, you know, digging away in on their computers, making these super complicated um, 3D maps of, of the library uh, based on different assumptions about how to build this um, map. Um, but there's only, I don't dislike most of the maps because they almost all of them 
do one thing that he, Borges was actually on record um, in an interview as saying is anathema and basically it just makes perfect sense. He says like, there can't be any empty spaces. Um, there can't be just blank holes because that's the whole point of using hexagons. It fills up all the space. Um, you know, they, they call it, you know, in science or, or, or math, they call it packing, you know, um, and it, you know, it's, it packs perfectly. Um, so most of the solutions that people come up with have a packing problem. So they have like, they don't fit together perfectly. And there's really only one map that, that really nicely follows most of the rules of the library and, and packs together. And so I made a version of this um, that, um, that I thought should, um, would also bring in the aspect of color. Um, and in part because um, I, uh, as, as I've drawn back Borges to this notion of the, of Blanqui's book in 1871, which, which leads to Nietzsche, which leads to Benjamin, which leads to all this other thought, I have been you know, amazed to discover how basically so such a great amount of theos theosophical, occult, and modernist thought is really goes back to Goethe and his theory of colors. Um, so I wanted to have something that would represent that. Um, so, and also represent diversity of, of, of knowledge in, in terms of color. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very carefully constructed um, um, uh, non-pattern, which is a hard thing to make. Um, you know, human eye wants to find patterns of six colors, but not a Newtonian one. It's sort of a hybrid, Gertian one, um, if that's the word, um, and it basically shows the uh, e that each room of the uh, library has uh, a, a a ventilation shaft, which is represented by the color, um, and four walls that have books on them, and then two doorways to a uh, another room with a um, spiral staircase, and goes on forever that way. So it goes on in every direction this way and this, you know, X, X, Y, and Z. So forward and towards you. Um, and the eye actually has, a, it, when you look at it in person, it has a, just because of the color values, it, it has a kind of three dimensionality to it. Um, and is the Fouchoir thing is a, <laughs> it's like a long, complicated thing to explain, but it's in inspired by some Sonia Delaunay and Man Ray um, prints from the 20s um, that based on this very special kind of way of, of creating um, uh, paint on paper, basically. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a kind of, you know, abstraction of the, the, the map and, um, and it's trying to create um, the something that is missing from the rest of the show, which is color. Right. Um, on the notion of missing, I feel like, you know, one of the things we don't want to miss out on is the chance for everyone else to ask you questions um, because it's all those other perspectives that do provide the color. Um, so with that, I will step to the side and let the VR team start to um, present what I gather are a number of questions that have been pouring in during this whole talk. <laughs> they most certainly have. Um, thank you both for taking us on that journey. Um, I know the audience is really excited to get to talk with you directly, so I'm going to just go and go through my order. Um, and I'm happy to read for folks if anybody can't turn their mic on for some reason, just shoot me a, a chat. Um, so Craig, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, Craig Stockwell, there you go. You got the mic. <laughs> yeah, hi. So um, my question is about the physicality of hot glass and your relationship still at this point to that very mysterious hot honey. And uh, I was a RISD painting student who fell into Chihuly's workshop and ended up working with glass and uh, understand that initial draw. But I'm just curious how how uh, how much you are engaged in the physicality of it at this point. I don't mean, are you still doing it yourself? I, I'm more just the feeling for it. Um, uh, 
Well, I mean, I guess that I'm, uh, um, I'm constantly making, uh, using it. I'm, I mean, I'm often using it. I'm not, you know, not always, but I would say that um, many days of the year I'm, I'm working with it. And, and that, and as um, uh, Charlotte mentioned, you know, like my work is, is very collaborative. And so I work with uh, a small group of people in my studio, who, some of whom have worked with me for 15 years. And we uh, have a kind of incredible um, synchro synchronous relationship of, of making. And it's, a, it's an incredibly um, <laughs> laborious and long process, often making things. And I guess my relationship to it is, is one of, um, of pure joy of working with these other people. Um, and then the rest of it is um, one of just uh, of uh, um, absurdity, um, total absurdity. I, I, I basically, uh, essentially, I don't know how to do anything well because um, I'm always trying to do something new. And so I'm just failing over and over and over again. So basically, fortunately, you can recycle a lot of my failures in terms of the physical failure part, but my time, obviously I can't recycle my time. So basically I spend um, a, uh, a huge amount of my time um, in this strange state of, um, of uh, failure. Um, and it's, and that, maybe that sounds like a hyperbole, but I, I literally mean that. It's, it's this sort of funny thing where, where I'm constantly trying to figure out like, okay, should I give up? But if I give up, that will feel bad. So I'll finish this so that it might be, I'll learn something for the next one, but I know this one is a total failure. So it's a very funny, a funny relationship with, um, because, you know, like it's a material that, and a process that is unforgiving. It's just, it's like playing music. So once you start, you start. And then once you get to the end, you get to the end and basically you can't stop. So it's sort of like, yeah, it's like you 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 play to the you play to the end, and you either played really lousy or or you played well, and and um, or or who's to even judge? But you know, it's like you did what you did. So it's I don't know if that answers your question well, but um. yeah, I just I think that's wonderful, and the the engagement with the physicality with an art of yours, which is otherwise incredibly wonderfully intellectual. I think that's a, a lovely balance. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, cheers. Next, we have a question from Lynn. Lynn, passing you the mic. Hello. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, during it, there was a split screen. And on one side, we saw images, colors, objects. And on the other side behind you, these very neatly bound books. Um, and clearly made up of words. And it, it made me just wonder if you, how you differentiate between um, things that you would put in a book and things that you would put in a visual medium. Um, well, I have to be totally honest that like, that a lot of these books are, are I use them for pictures. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the, I mean, some some of them are a section of it is which is literature, and uh, but a lot of it is pictures. Um, so they're um, so a lot of them are are shapes or forms or visual ideas. So that so they're actually um, like right now I have a whole collection of um, uh, antiquated or out of date books on galaxies and for certain projects and and basically like one uh ones that are um where they're like washed out are especially interesting like i have i've been looking at different photographic representations of galaxies and so i'm like not not at all interested in the latest ones i'm interested in sort of ones that have different visual effects um so some of it is actually like that like a tool where i can actually take the information and actually fairly somewhat directly translate it um and then there's the ideas from books which are uh written that are like a story or or literature or poetry that um that yeah that that's a kind of um 
magic. Like, and I think that one of the things that, uh, uh, that I'm really interested in is the notion of um, a kind of envy, envy of other mediums. So basically, I think it's really a really common thing. Um, basically, if you are, there's, there's, I think there's two kinds of, of artists, uh, artists who are envious of other kinds of artists and, and those who aren't. So basically I'm the, I'm the envious one. I like, I'm envy dancers. I envy musicians. I envy writers. I envy, you know, um, um, uh, a whole series of people. And so I, uh, uh, I guess that I'm, um, how you translate uh, one thing from one kind of medium to another is is a really and how you work from one in one medium versus another is a really uh, an amazing thing. So essentially, like I I want to be connected to other mediums, other people's ways of working. And so books are other people's ways of working. I mean, books are a work of art in and of themselves. I mean, I've had I've made some books myself, um, and uh, my partner. Um, I have to get permission from her to make other books because it's like so, so it, it takes over your life completely. Um, and a book is a work of art too. And, and bookmaking is an art, an art process. And um, so, so these are all artworks. So in a way it's like, mm. you could say to translate this into a visual artwork is, is not that different than to say, I went to the ballet and how do I translate that into a, um, into a visual artwork. So that, so that question is, I mean, it's hard. To, I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I think it's, it's one that is, um, that uh, I like to think about this notion of envy because basically it, 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 the, it, you develop a hunger to like, there's something that's happening in this dance. How do I make that happen in, in what I'm doing visually? Or there's something that's in this mm -hmm. poem. How do I make that happen in some way in this thing I'm doing visually. And there's no, never a good answer to that question, <laughs> but, you, but maybe in the desire that something happens. Mm -hmm. Great answer, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, wonderful. So next I'm gonna pass the mic to GE. Um, we got a ton of questions today and we're gonna do our best to get through all of them. I'll try to go faster. <laughs> no, you're giving good answers. It's not a question. Hi, thank you so much to Rail and to, to Joshua and to Charlotte for this amazing presentation. I am so glad you brought up uh, Peter Shebart. Um because I was always struck by, um, and I'm wondering if your work seems to, to affirm his maximum that colored glass destroys all hatred at last. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't, I mean, somebody asked me if I was, uh, the other day, if I was a, a feminist and I said, well, if you, if you would grant that I'm a feminist, I'm happy, but I, it's not, it's not something I can claim. It's something I could be given as a title. Um, I, and I would hope that somebody might view me as feminist. Um, the same thing I would say that if you wanted to say that my work was saying that embodying colored glass destroys all hatred at last, I would be very happy. Um, I don't know if I'm achieving that. Um, I Yes, I published um, 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 uh, uh, a couple of books on Shearbart and, um, uh, and one of the things that I have uh, spent literally um, I mean, or, or I, I know you're not supposed to use the word literally that way. Uh, I've, used, I spe I've spent a couple hundred hours on is actually translating those couplets that that comes from. And um, so, uh, so colored glass destroys old hatred at last uh, and um, is, is basically my favorite version of it. Um, uh, so I think it's, it, it's going back to humor um, and going back to being wrong, um, that I stand on that ground that, that that statement is something that can help us somehow. Uh, and basically that also follows into the film, which uh, is in the show, which has a lot to do with color healing, which was um, colored light healing. Um, and which is, you know, a very dangerous idea that, that um, 
uh, one of the big um, pieces, parts of the library is, is this man named Din Shah who went to prison. Um, he was, I think he was, it, it was both dangerous for him and I think he was somewhat dangerous himself in some sense, but his ideas about thinking about that colored light might heal, it's, we, it, it's not that we should take it literally that colored light, you don't need to go to the doctor to help with your cancer. It's, uh, but the idea that colored light might heal at some level might teach us something else about how we reform society. And, um, and basically, how do you destroy hatred? I mean, that's a really good question. Like, we need to think about that right now all the time. And if colored light, like, could destroy hatred, wow. I mean, let's try, you know what I mean? Immediately. Um, so, and, and as well, like it's, it's that, that if, if we can destroy some hatred with beginning with some humor, um, maybe there's an answer there too, or a start. start. Thank you very much. Um, so next I have actually our final question for today in the interest of getting to our very important poetry reading, um, Fong Bui. Fong, I believe you can control your mic. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Josiah. Thank you, Charlotte, for this illuminating conversation. Thank you so much. Well, I, I don't know I have a question. It's all been asked and answered so nicely, but I would say this. When I think of um, Josiah's work, your work, Josiah, I think of the term of uh, 19th century concept of cosmic totality or cosmic unity, I would say, where matters of philosophical knowledge and scientific knowledge are somehow more invested in the material structure um, and certain order that somehow you manage to create to govern your own work. And in thinking about uh, what you just say, your envy of poets and writer and other creative individual. And, and true to the fact that you've been talking to everything else, I couldn't help but to remember one of my favorite quotes. I think it described you quite nicely here, Josiah, by Giordano, Giordano Bruno. I think he must have said it before he will burn a stake at the Campio de Fure in 1600, uh, he say, the truest and the most essential painter is the liveliness of fantasy. The first and most essential poet is inspiration, which is co-equal with thought and by the divinity or divinely set influence of which thought become due and suitable representation of both. Mm. Inspiration is the most innermost principle. The philosophers are, in certain sense, painters. The poets are painters and philosophers, and the painters are philosophers and poets. True poets, painters, and philosophers love and admire each other, each other mutually. He is no painter who does not poetize and paint. Therefore, it is say without reason to understand is to contemplate the figure of our fantasy. He is no painter who does not in some degree poetize and think, and with our certain thinking and painting, no one is a poet. I think, I, ho I hope I remember correctly. <laughs> it's been a while, <laughs> but I, I did that for you, Josiah. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and it's been a great honor and I've learned a lot and I, um, yeah, thank you very much. Oh, it's been our great pleasure. Um, and it's not over yet because we will close with poetry as our tradition when we were physically together in the office and is now our tradition in this space. Um, so I'm really thrilled to invite Eileen R. Tavios today. Um, Eileen has released collections of poetry, fiction, and experimental biographies from publishers in 10 countries, including a first poetry book, Beyond Life Sentences, which received the Philippines National Book Award. Um, without further ado, Eileen, over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you to the Brooklyn Rail and for having me here. I'm pleased to join you from the land of the Wapo, the first peoples of Napa Valley, California, to whom I'm grateful for their hospitality. I'll be reading uh, two poems, both inspired by one of uh, Josiah's artworks. Am I waiting for the image, uh, Sophie? Yes. Um, for the first poem, right. So this um, crystal landscape painting um, inspired a poem that I entitled, The Edges of Flesh Are Not Straight. Wasn't it Baudelaire who could only feel the significance of sky by jailing its expanse between the edges of parallel skyscrapers? Manhattan might throw up glass buildings but can't avoid the gray interruptions of steel scaffolding, no matter how thin, as if steel can mimic air. Thus, dear sapphire sky, dim yourself to accommodate the light within four walls offering a home, new to you, but a compromise you accept because objects can be touched. Converse with the light behind your sudden triangles because objects can be shaped. The light manifests as slim glass pyramids. Note how its air lacks scars, how it welcomes the transformation of image into a physical relationship. So intimate, it leaves the wall to become three dimensional for you. And the second artwork um, uh, and the second poem is, in, is, is inspired by an end to modernity, which we see here. Uh, this um, poem is written as a prose poem, which I'm compelled to share only because um, in a verse poem, you have line breaks. And I did not want to bear the coincidence that the length of each line might end up mimicking um, some way the length of any one of these rods coming out of the sphere in the middle. And so it's a parag it's based in paragraphs because I also thought paragraphs was a more apt manifestation of the roundness of the sphere in the center of the work. So the title of this poem is Ekphrasis Should Not Exist. And I should also say there's a word in the poem called kapwa. Kapwa is a Filipino indigenous trait that relates to the shared identity between oneself and others. So that's kapwa. Ekphrasis should not exist. Whenever someone defines poetry, I compare my work and it's an exception. Thus the artist creates a metaphor for that big bang that destroyed ideal unity, or is it idealism, in order to create a different world. But this sculpture of rupture incorporates a multitude of glass ellipses. Thus the world we, as we know it is pockholed with breakable elements. This is the world as we know it, where the possibility for more breakage lingers. Thus what stays are debris of impossibilities, like the capture of what is ineffable, like the touching of a horizon, like the stasis, stasis of an explosion, as if the explosion ended in physical evidence instead of lingers through resonance, like the definition of poetry already misspelled with the first letter capitalized. Thus my ancestors never leave me, they love me by reminding what the indigenous know. We all derive from the same luminous ball, seamless before rupture. The same ball where metal is glass, is fire, is water, is my preconceived enemy, is my secret lover, is you, is me. No wonder mirrors keep interrupting our gaze. We shouldn't be seeing ourselves. We should be being ourselves. Thus my ancestors caress this sculpture with sorrow. To rupture is to create difference. 
where kapwa once existed. Now we have categories like glass, metal, reflections, spaces birthed by separations, the anguish of distance, the regret of time, the illusion of time, and finally the difference between witness and what is seen. Once upon a time, we were what we saw. Thus the homesick poet writes, see me, while spelling the plea for lucidity as S-E-A. Water, even salted, fills the most minute space, the most minute crack. Thus when the analytical mind dances its misinterpretations of an artwork, do accept the results. The dance is an attempt to return to that from which it was sundered, music. Thus, ekphrasis should not exist. I look at an explosion only to see behind it, a gorgeous, stunning sculpture. But beauty in this world always exacts a price. Now, Expensive perfume wrinkles your nose as a voice off stage chides a pink cheeked toddler suddenly crawling by your ankles. The anonymous voice chides, Don't touch. Thus, capitalism reminds us in this new world don't touch, it's fragile. Thus, Capua reminds us in this new world. Touch, we are all fragile. Hug. Thank you for listening and hugs to you all. Wow. Thank you very much. I see snapping and clapping and, <laughs> and hearts coming from across the, across the room. Um, that was a wonderful way to end. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Josiah. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Eileen. It's been a real pleasure. Um, for all of you in the audience, The Rail is celebrating its 20th anniversary as a nonprofit, um, dedicated to providing free and accessible criticism and building community um, among creatives. So if you enjoyed today's conversation, consider becoming a subscriber or making a donation to support the work. Um, tomorrow, we'll be joined by Noel Anderson and Robert Shane um, with a poetry reading from Johannes Goransson. Um, if you would like to join us, it's at the same time, 1 p.m. Um, this is the moment where we can all say goodbye to each other. Let the chaos reign. <laughs> I invite you to turn on your mics and shout out your goodbyes from wherever you're tuning in from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful conversation. Thank you. 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 Eileen, thank you. Yeah, Eileen. That was beautiful, Eileen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Eileen, yeah, that was amazing. Oh, thank you so much. Fabulous. Hey, Joshua, how are you? I know, right? <laughs> Roxane, hello. Thank you so much. You that was wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Lynn. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful lunch time, everybody. Yes. Thank you, you guys. Bye. Sending much love and courage. <laughs>